Welcome to our AIS podcast. This episode is recorded in cooperation with the US Embassy and is a special series on EU-US relations. My guest today is Nathaniel O. Kohane, and today we talk about climate diplomacy. Nathaniel Kohane is the president of the Center for Climate and Energy Solutions, the C2ES, which is a center that is widely recognized in the United States and also internationally as a leading independent voice for practical policy and action to address our energy and climate challenges. Nathaniel Cohen is an economist with more than 20 years of energy and environmental policy experience. And he has worked with academia, government and the nonprofit sector. And he was most recently the senior vice president for climate with the Environmental Defense Fund, the EDF. There, he shaped effective and economical climate policy. He also holds a position as a junk professor of law at the New York University. And in 2011 to 2012, he served in the Obama administration as special assistant to the president for energy and environment in the National Economic Council and Domestic Policy Council. There, he helped to develop and coordinate administration policy on a wide range of energy and environmental issues. Previously to that, he directed economic policy and analysis at EDF, working to enact comprehensive cap and trade legislation in Congress. Furthermore, he holds a PhD from Harvard University and a BA from Yale College. Welcome, Nathaniel. Thanks very much. It's great to be talking with you today. Thank you. In the recent years, the diplomatic relationship between the US and the EU has deteriorated. So this has been particularly acute due to the political posturing around the COVID-19 crisis. There has actually been a move towards national responses to this crisis rather than more coordinated international efforts. And this is actually similar to how countries approach the climate crisis. Although climate change is now internationally recognized as threatening economic stability and well being, which in fact hasn't always been the case. <laughs> um, the mitigation tactics lack international cooperation and joint measures. While the Paris Agreement provides international targets, the realization generally lacks global diplomacy. However, now, this year, 2021, could represent an important step towards climate diplomacy, since the countries are due to submit revised pledges to the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change. Moreover, they will meet at the 26th session of the Conference of the Parties in Glasgow in November to discuss global mitigation plans to meet the objectives of the Paris Agreement. So my first question to you is, what do you think needs to be done to increase climate diplomacy between the US and the EU? Well, I think you've hit on a really important issue here, which is a couple of important issues. One is, of course, the critical importance of collaboration and cooperation between the US and Europe as the two major historical emitters in the US has emitted more cumulatively than any other country, including or bloc, including the EU. But I think the EU is right behind it. So they're while their emissions are going down, they remain the most advanced economies, the richest economies in the world, and the ones that mm -hmm. have done the most in the past to contribute to the problem. So that cooperation between the US and EU is going to be critical. Mm -hmm. I think right now, I mean, right now, if you just took a snapshot today, you'd say, oh, it looks like it's going pretty well. Look at the pictures from the G7, look at the pictures from the climate summit that President Biden hosted in April, the Biden administration clearly came into the White House ready to go, firing on all cylinders um, and uh, ready to devote a kind of whole of government approach mm -hmm. to climate. And I think that's been reflected in what we see in the US-EU 
relationship. Mm -hmm. The challenge, which I think you alluded to, and which I'm sure we'll talk about more throughout the podcast, is that uh, the the question hangs over the U.S. how and hangs over for everybody. How mm -hmm. long will that last? Yeah. Um, the Biden administration is clearly all in on climate, but the Trump administration did its mm -hmm. best. It's ineffectual best, but it still spent four mm -hmm. years trying to go the other direction. And there are lots of folks in capitals around Europe and in Brussels um, asking whether they can rely on the United States yeah. again, uh, given the four years in Trump. I'd like to think so. I'm, 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 a, I'm an optimist. Um, but there's a lot of work to be done, I think, to rebuild that trust to rebuild that credibility gap. One of the things I think mm -hmm. though that's, that's interesting to note here, uh, and, and this is something uh, I think we are, I, 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 was, I was suggesting that this would be the case back in November, December, and I think we're seeing it is the case. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the US faces frankly, a credibility gap and a trust gap mm -hmm. across a number of issues, not just on climate change. Um, Trump pulled out of the Iran nuclear agreement. He threatened, he rattled the cage and putting her out of NATO. He pulled out of WTO. Um, so it was really across the board. And I think one thing we do see is that climate is an area, not the only one, certainly, and we can talk about COVID as well, but climate is, a, is, a, is an important area where the Biden administration has an opportunity to actually help address that credibility gap mm -hmm. in a way that helps U.S. standing across a whole range of issues. Um, and that's in part because unlike the Iran nuclear deal, which was going to require lots of renegotiation and so on, the Biden administration could come back into the Paris Agreement on day one, as, mm -hmm. Biden, as President Biden did. Um, he can do aggressive, um, active diplomacy globally on climate, as he did in the lead up. And, and he and John Kerry, the president, special presidential envoy on climate, did in the lead up to the climate summit and since. Uh, and so I think we're seeing the US take a much more active posture and, and that's, I think, helping um, address some of that credibility gap uh, mm -hmm. across the board for the US. So I think the US, we're seeing the right things from the Biden administration. I think they understand the importance of climate for their broader agenda, in addition to also believing that climate change is the crisis of our time. Um, but it's going to have to translate into uh, greater assurances that the U.S. is here to stay and is a reliable partner for the long run. Yeah, I I definitely think so too. This is also my opinion. Um, I also think that the rebuilding of trust and credibility of the U.S. is now really important. And this actually comes to the point of the Biden administration. You've mentioned Trump has done quite some harm in this regard in pulling out of the Paris Agreement which of course Biden is now trying to reverse or he did reverse it. Um, also US history has actually shown that climate policy has always been a part more of a partisan issue in politics. Um, looking for example at the Obama administration, mm -hmm. they were much, much more determined in fighting climate change than Trump, for example, afterwards. And as you already said, the EU also hopes to restore diplomatic ties again between the US and the EU um, after this four year term of Donald Trump. And of course, not only economically, but also in regards to climate change. Now Biden has announced some significant changes in the US climate climate policy, including the net zero target for 2050. Um, but how do you think will actually the Biden administration influence international climate cooperation, given this potential short-lived nature of the US climate policy that you've also mentioned? Yeah, I, no, I think I think it's a good good question. And here I would distinguish between setting targets and the ambition mm -hmm. of targets mm -hmm. and implementation of those targets, right? So those are, those are both important. If you don't set ambitious targets, you're never gonna meet any ambitious targets, but, mm -hmm. but, it's, but you can't just set the targets and, and let them go. And I yeah. think what we've seen, not surprisingly, we have seen a real impact on 
international climate cooperation at that level of target setting. I mean, so it's fairly shallow, but we've mm -hmm. seen it almost immediately. And, um, you know, I think to the Biden administration's credit, they really pulled out all the stops uh, immediately upon coming in, as I said a minute ago, to, the, to office, mm -hmm. uh, scheduled that climate summit. John Kerry did a huge amount of shuttle and his team did a huge amount of shuttle diplomacy in the lead up to it. And as a result, you did see a wave of new, more ambitious uh, climate targets. Now, this is not, I, I should say, this, this has been, it didn't start happening just when Biden came in. It also reflects the work that the European Union has done over the past four yeah. years to, main, to, to sort of keep climate leadership up during the dark period of Trump's uh, presidency. So it's not as if, you know, the world changed uh, entirely on January 20th. Um, you already had these trends. You had this momentum. You had Xi Jinping, uh, it, uh, President mm -hmm. of China, uh, making a carbon neutrality goal. So you, you had some of the carbon neutrality and net zero goals coming online even last year. But I think that was accelerated and got a boost mm -hmm. from the Biden administration. I think we'll continue to see that. There were some company. There were some countries um, that uh, did not complete or codify their new nationally determined contributions, their targets for the next round. They didn't quite do that by April, but they pledged to do that by COP26 in Glasgow in November. Mm -hmm. And I think the U.S. continues to press. So at that level, which is admittedly shallow, it's the surface level that you can see, but it's important. We're seeing the kind of ambition. We're beginning to see the kind of ambition that is commensurate with the challenge in terms of setting targets. But then you look at implementation and we're way behind. I mean, across the board in terms of in the world. The EU, again, being an exception, although even the EU has a significant challenge ahead of it to meet its target. But I think the EU is better positioned than, ever, than anybody else. So then when you look at implementation, I think the that's where two things, uh, two points you know, related to what you said. First is, the effect of the Biden administration is necessarily going to be less immediate, right? It's mm -hmm. not going to be the first year the way it was for targets. Everyone's happy to, if they, if they get to appear on the podium with the president, you know, he get, they get a visit from the U.S. president, they're happy to make an ambitious target. But the implementation is going to be key, yeah. and that's going to take much more time. And for the U.S. to have an influence on that, two things need to happen. First, the U.S. The US needs to show it's in, it's in it for the long game a little bit, so it won't be the first year. It may be the second or third or fourth year. And then also the U.S. needs to begin to implement its own targets. And that's where the issue is. That's, that's where we really face the crux of the issue yeah. because the Biden administration, I think we're seeing that it is willing to take steps domestically where it can with executive power. Um, we saw you know, largely symbolic, um, everything ranging from the largely symbolic action on the Keystone pipeline, which still is an important symbol, Mm -hmm. um, all the way to um, the not only the setting of the NDC, but um, actions that the administration is taking. We expect to soon see uh, new vehicle emission standards. Those will expect to be followed by methane, oil, and gas standards. Um, the administration is working on power plant standards and has made a push for climate to be a major part of its infrastructure package in Congress. Yeah. So the administration is doing a lot that it can, but the crux of the issue is any real long lasting policy, I mean, let's set aside cars because cars is actually an area where, yeah. uh, and, and, and even methane from oil and gas. Those are actually two important areas where the administration can do a lot on its own. But when you get to the power plants and industrial sectors, which are still very large chunks of the economy, um, that's really gonna require legislation from Congress. And anything that's economy wide is gonna require legislation from Congress. And that's where we're, stuck uh, in the US. And it's, and it's partly because of partisanship and polarization around climate change, but it's really because of a much broader set of issues around you know, the dysfunction in US politics at the moment. Um, and so climate, I think, is getting swept up in that. It's not as if Congress is passing all these other things and just won't pass anything on climate. Um, and so that's a real challenge. And that's a challenge for the U.S. democracy. It's a challenge for the fate of the you know, the, of the of the U.S. republic, and it's a challenge for the world on climate. Because to come back to the beginning of the question, 
I think we won't see the U.S. influence on international cooperation go any deeper Mm -hmm. than those surface target setting. We won't see it go any deeper than the surface target setting into implementation until we really see the kind of follow through and and commitment from the U.S. uh, as a whole. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that that's the key problem. Of course, the Biden administration is really ambitious in setting targets, as you already said. But when it comes to implementation, it's really hard to pass the legislation in Congress. Um, I think that's a major issue because when looking at the EU, for example, it didn't matter who held the presidency. There was always a clear line regarding climate change. Mm -hmm. And that's something that the US just doesn't have. It's really difficult. And also- And maybe if there's, there's, Mm -hmm. sorry, if there's one thing I can just add here, because I don't, I, I, so I want to give the administration credit, but I also want to make clear that it's, it's the administration can't just say, oh boy, well, Congress, and I don't think they're saying this, but to, to be fair, but the administration can't just say, well, boy, we have to face Congress and that's tough, right? Every country has a legislature mm-hmm. and, and politics are always hard. As you say, they might not be as partisan or as hard in the EU, but they are, I mean, I can point to areas where, you know, there are exemptions and holes yeah. and weaknesses in every country, right? So every country's leadership needs needs to deal with those politics and figure out a way around them. And I think it's incumbent on the Biden administration to continue. They they sort of, they've talked the talk, they've said the right things. They need to continue to walk the walk on making climate a priority Mm -hmm. for legislation. And that means in the, in the immediate sense, I know most of the listeners probably will be on the other side of the Atlantic, but of course the right now in Washington, DC, everybody is focused on the infrastructure package and infrastructure legislation. Yeah. And it looks like we're gonna get a bipartisan package that is smaller and more traditional roads and highways and surface transportation. And then there's the question, well, what happens to the other big chunk of infrastructure that includes climate and energy infrastructure as well as sort of human capital infrastructure. Yeah. And from the climate point of view, the answer is the Biden administration can't let Congress off the hook yeah. and can't simply say, okay, well, we wanna, go back to this bipartisan, you know, we, we, we were, we're just going to be satisfied with a bipartisan package. Mm-hmm. Great to get that bipartisan package, but if it doesn't include the kind of climate and energy provisions that it's, that are required to get the country on track to meet the targets that Biden has set out, then the administration, it's incumbent on the administration to push by every means it has and to twist arms to use the, rec- the budget reconciliation process, which only requires 50 votes, to do everything it can to get those climate provisions into law. Yeah, of course, that's challenging. And also now at times even more challenging if you have a look at for, for the COVID-19 pandemic, for example. Mm. So it's not only, of course, issue with climate change, but also what has happened there socially, economically on so many multiple levels. And also, of course, similar to COVID-19, climate change is also a threat to the national security. This mm-hmm. comes on top. And as we just have established before also, um, value of partners are needed in order to tackle the climate crisis. And therefore I wanted to ask you what in your opinion are the most pressing security issues connected to climate change? Well, I mean, I think that the overarching security issue connected to climate change is the prospect of mass human migration. Mm-hmm. Because we are at the point where in the next, we're already starting to see, and in the next decade or two, um, as we see global temperatures continue to rise, especially in some of the hottest areas of the world, as we see drought continuing to rise, putting mm-hmm. huge pressure on food production. Um, we're, we're already starting to see this. We're gonna see much more of this. We're gonna see people moving in enormous numbers or seeking yeah. to migrate in enormous numbers, whether that's because of food pressure, whether that's because of conflict, like we're already seeing, we've already, you can already trace, experts will already trace some of the Mideast conflicts in Northern Africa to climate challenges. Not, it's not, not that it's the sole contributor, but that it's an exacerbator, right? If you're already in a place that has 
sectarian divisions and yeah. deep rooted tensions. And then you throw on top of that heat stress, food stress, water stress, you're going to get, it's a contributor to, to conflict, but it's also in some places of the world, it's getting too, I mean, you, you look at the projections, it'll be too hot to live outside, right. Yeah. And to work outside. So for all of those reasons, the exacerbation of conflict, the creation of new stresses like food stress and drought stress, and then the sheer temperature, you're going to mm -hmm. see people, you're going to see huge pressure on migration, which is going to dwarf what we've seen, you know, what we saw in Europe, yeah. um, you know, earlier in the decade, which yeah. strained Europe's ability to absorb immigrants and threatened to break, I mean, really put probably as much pressure on the European Union as we've seen, uh, you know, in the past uh, several decades. Um, and then, you know, the politics of immigration uh, are one of the fault lines in the US and in the EU, and that's going to be stressed as well. So I think, the security issue that becomes a security issue, but it also becomes a political issue. Yeah. So that I think is is it, and the security issues, of course, multiply with conflict. It's not just about um, the pressures on migration, but it's also the the conflict that's happening. And mm -hmm. and so that's I think a big one. I think there's a secondary one as well, um, which is not necessarily directly related. It's it's not a factor maybe being driven by climate change mm -hmm. proper, but it is being in a sense it's a side effect, the byproduct of climate diplomacy or the lack thereof, the, the diminishing influence that the U.S. has in mm -hmm. key places around the world as a result of, you know, as a result partly of Trump's pulling back from, Amer from, from global leadership and other things. And, and as countries see the, as countries see, you know, climate, climate diplomacy is a barometer of other things, right? Um, how willing is the U.S. to take on its uh, it's it's the role it took on it had taken on since World War II of kind of the global hegemon and um, and and provider public goods and so if the U.S. is really stepping back from that that means a huge loss of strategic influence in the you know around the world and I think that has its own um, national security implications for the U.S. and 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 for the world um, so that's a that's mm -hmm. tangentially related because it the the channel to that is the diplomacy, but I think it's there's an interesting connection there to mm -hmm. climate. There definitely is. Um, but do you think can actually US and the EU um, climate diplomacy help in this issue in protecting national security? Well, so I think, if, you know, if you think about the two channels I just mm -hmm. laid out, think about running, you know, if you can address each of those two, then you can boost uh, you, you you can support national security. So the first one, yeah. action to reduce emissions and to really reduce the, all the things we were talking about in terms of implementation yeah. of those targets, action at home in the U.S. and then working with the EU and and countries to boost international cooperation and accelerate mm -hmm. climate action and reduction in emissions mitigation. That's going to be key to uh, making a difference in you know how high how fast temperatures rise and how, um, you know, and, and how fast water tables fall and, and being able to put a lid on some of that conflict. So that's certainly a channel. The other one, you know, the, the extent to which climate effective international climate diplomacy uh, from, from the US and the EU can be shown to be helping uh, developing countries and emerging economies today, not just in the future, that will be part of reversing the sort of loss of American influence and strategic influence I mentioned. And there actually, it's really important to mention something we haven't talked about yet, which is climate finance, yeah. right? Because it's the, the flow of uh, climate aid, development aid, investment, public and leveraged private investment in clean energy, in adaptation and resilience in the developing countries that are most vulnerable, right? The obvious ones are small island states, but low lying coastal states, and states in areas like Sub-Saharan Africa and South Asia that are at greatest risk of food stress and drought. Those are all areas where climate finance, both for clean energy and mitigation and for adaptation and resilience is going to be critical. It's critical from, a, from the perspective of addressing and alleviating that kind of suffering and, it's also, and, 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 the, and, and driving clean energy development and, and prosperity. It's also critical politically because yeah. we go back to climate diplomacy, uh, a climate diplomacy that's founded in, that, that is trying to establish climate diplomacy only on 
exhortation about doing more to reduce emissions and you know here's what the us is doing we want everybody to do more that's an important part of it but that by itself is never going to be sufficient because the rest because developing world developing countries emerging economies want they want to develop they want to prosper yeah. and if they're not going to do that in the sort of high carbon pathway of the past then they're um, they want to see how rich countries can help them in that prospect and help them along that pathway. And I think that's an important role for the U.S. Mm -hmm. and the, uh, for the U.S. to play. Definitely. Also helping um, developing countries. Uh, I think so as well. It's actually the same also with the, can only draw um, similarities to the COVID-19 crisis we're having mm -hmm. now. It's also, yep. it was also essential helping these countries. Actually, also speaking of the COVID-19 crisis, do you think that the crisis had an impact on the U.S.-EU um, climate diplomacy? You know, I, I think at least for me, I'm, I'm sure mm -hmm. there are people more expert in this than I am. For me, it's a little early to say in part yeah. because the tale of the pandemic response for the U.S. has been two completely different stories, mm -hmm. right? Under Trump, you had um, China bashing. I mean, by the way, I, I do think there are some legitimate questions, frankly, um, about the or you know about about the spread of the virus and so on. But you had you had just this completely you know uh, one sided China bashing, yeah. completely ineffectual uh, efforts at home, anti science messaging, anti mask. I mean, this just completely botched response internally and zero you know, zero COVID diplomacy externally under Trump, and under Biden you've had a 180 degree reversal, right? And you, the one thing I will say, right, the, the Trump administration did one thing right, which was invest in a number of vaccines. I mean, that was the one yeah. thing they did right was invest in a number of vaccines and mm -hmm. be willing to pay up front for them. And now you see the fruits of it. I have to say, I mean, this is one of the, I know lots of folks have commented on this. I live in New York City mm -hmm. and I've been here the whole time through. And I remember in the period, you know, I remember back in April and May of last year, 2020, you could hear sirens throughout the day. Uh, you saw the hospital, you saw the, the infirmaries being set up in Central Park. Uh, the counts were the highest in the world. Um, the city totally shut down. That was one of the darkest moments, I think, of yeah. the city's history. And it was the epicenter for a while of the pandemic. Now, because of the vaccination, which is such a privilege for the U.S. Uh, as the sort of best, the richest country in the world, right? New York is totally reopened. And yet the rest of the world, that's totally different, right? Out, mm -hmm. Certainly outside of the U.S. Uh, and, 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 and I realize, you know, Europe is also on that track too, but not quite there. And so that gulf that's opening up is as big as anything I think we've seen, certainly in my lifetime. Um, and so, especially as the Delta variant and now the Lambda variant starts taking hold. And so understanding what that means in terms of the moral imperative for the US to help mm -hmm. other countries, as well as the diplomatic opportunity there. Um, you know, I, I think that's really critical and that might have some lessons and might have some carryover for, for climate, um, you know, in terms of that, what people are calling vaccine diplomacy. China. Contrast it with China, right? There's an interesting contrast here with China, both on COVID and then carrying over into climate. On COVID, China was early out of the gate with COVID, with, with vaccine diplomacy, with the Sinovac and the other vaccine. Those are proving not to be effective. And if you look at the countries around the world that had Mongolia, Bangladesh, and so on, these, these countries have you know the highest rates of vaccination, and yet they're being ravaged by new variants because that vaccination, those vaccinations are not nearly as effective. And so I'm not, you know, that's, that's a, that has a terrible human toll. I'm not saying, oh, wow, this is, you know, the U.S. should take advantage of this, but it is, a, it, I am observing that mm -hmm. the U.S. is in a position where be, for a whole bunch of reasons, right? Deep seated reasons around innovation and science and and still a very strong medical establishment. So, and the U.S. is in a position to be able to really help the yeah. rest of the world with vaccines that work. Okay, so that's an interesting observation because in climate, you also have a situation where yeah. 
China has been quick out of the gate in terms of making investments, not necessarily in green. And this might change, but it'll come back. But China, through its Belt and Road initi Initiative, has been making huge, massive infrastructure investments, needed infrastructure investments in the rest of the world, where the U.S. has been pulling back. Um, but it's been doing that so far in a way that has been very coal heavy, fossil heavy, carbon intensive, right? So yeah. now if you look at climate, we're at this fork in the road with respect to global infrastructure building. How do we shift from a situation in which, the, which China is really focusing on fossil intensive infrastructure and the U.S. is completely pulling back to one in which ideally China and the U.S. are cooperating yeah. on pushing out green infrastructure. There are, you know, I know we're going further afield, but I mention this only because this is one of the critical issues for global climate diplomacy, for, for the fate of the world, what happens with the Belt and Road Initiative mm -hmm. in China. There are folks in the Chinese government who want to see that as done in a green way. They want to see a green BRI. So how do we, the, the, the paramount issue right now, I think for global climate diplomacy, in addition to the issues we've been talking about before and so on is how to encourage and push and pressure China to use its BRI initiative as a means of funding green energy, renewable energy, low carbon development around the world and have that be joined by the US and Europe again, putting finance into developing countries, emerging economies, into low carbon prosperity. How do we shift to that world rather than the world we've been in? And mm -hmm. perhaps there are some lessons, very different, but perhaps there are some lessons from what we've seen in COVID that can be applied there. Mm -hmm. I, I think so too. Yeah, definitely China is also one of the top three emitters among US, EU. Um, so well, it's the biggest by <laughs> far, right? I mean, current in current terms, it's by, China is by far the biggest. Yeah. Um, in historical terms, of course, it's there's still a few years before I think it catches up. Of course, of course. But if we look at the situation now, um, climate diplomacy must go beyond EU, US must also always involve China and therefore also yeah. involve less developed countries and developing countries mm -hmm. as well. Otherwise... I don't think that there is a way. So actually now having a look into the future, um, what is your outlook for the next decade? Well, it comes back to what we've been talking about, which is implementation, right? Yeah. We are finally getting, thanks to the leadership of the EU over the past four years, thanks to the work of activists and NGOs around the world, the pressure of people like Greta Thunberg and, and the whole youth movement she represents, people who, you know, there's a whole variety of voices. There's such a much greater variety and diversity and breadth and volume of voices calling for climate action than yeah. we had even a decade ago um, in the US and the EU, but also around the world, right? From, from, um, from, from all aspects, of, at least from all aspects, in the US from all aspects of the kind of center and center left and left wing political spectrum, maybe not. Uh, maybe, maybe not too much further than maybe the center right. But the point is there's such a breadth and diversity of voices. Mm -hmm. And that has made a difference in terms of the level of ambition we're seeing from in the targets. And so what that means is that the key thing going forward is focusing on implementation. Um, I am a congenital optimist. I wouldn't be in this mm -hmm. role. I wouldn't wake up every day and work on climate if I didn't think we had a path forward. Um, We've got a number of tailwinds behind us that make mm -hmm. me optimistic. Technological change is an extraordinarily powerful force. Uh, if you look at the falling costs of wind and solar power, battery yeah. storage, other you know sources of clean power, those have fallen. You know, wind is, wind power has fallen something like seventy percent, solar ninety percent in the past decade, and that's on top of earlier gains that were just as big. So we have huge increases in technological, you know, huge improvements in technology. We have the ability to electrify countries that, you know, the places, you know, India, mm -hmm. which still has 300 billion people without electricity. We have ability to do that in a way that's low carbon, that's clean, that's much healthier, and not just for the planet, but also for people, you know, local communities and so on. So we have that tremendous technological, um, and, and, and that technological progress extends to transportation, extends to cars, extends to air travel, extends to industrial uses. Okay, so uh, we have all of that we have a tremendous opportunity in front of us to make immediate progress in areas like tropical deforestation, where we know how 
to do a much greener, uh, sustainable approach, and we can protect the forest. We're, there's we're innovative approaches to, to channeling finance and so on. So we have the tools, right? Um, but it's that transformation from the political will to make targets, which we're finally starting to get, to the real political will required to implement them and the hard work of putting that in place. I don't mean hard by it's super expensive or, you know, I don't mean that at all. I, I think there's, mm-hmm. I think there's a route to low carbon prosperity. That's much, a much more prosperous future mm-hmm. world than, than a high carbon one, but it is hard work in terms of the politics. It's hard work in terms of transforming some of our economies. Um, and that's the work that needs to be done. And so I'm optimistic because we have the potential and the technologies and the solutions mm-hmm. we need um, to meet our climate goals. Um, but it's going to take the hard work of continuing to mobilize voices, continuing to develop smart policies. We haven't talked a lot about the private sector, yeah. but you know, mobilizing, continuing to mobilize in private sector leadership and private sector voices, an area where we see lots of leadership coming on, um, harnessing all of those powerful forces and putting them in the direction of um, real policies that can effectively implement uh, and cut pollution at the pace and the scale required. Mm -hmm. Um, So, you know, ambition is accelerating, but it needs to speed up. Yeah. And, uh, and that's, that's the work ahead of us. Mm -hmm. That's, that's good. Um, Well, we know what needs to be done, but how, how can we do that? Are there concrete actions? I mean, of course, mobilize voices, but how? Yeah. So if we think about concrete, okay, fine. So if we think about concrete actions, um, clearly, so you, you can tick through what are the major sources of emissions and what are we going to need to get to net zero, right? And when I think about what needs to happen, I think about, you know, what does the next 10 years look like? Yeah. And then what are the next, what are the 20 years after that look like? Because you think in the US, for example, we've got the target of cutting emissions in half relative to 2005 by 2030. That is doable, but it's a big challenge. And then getting to net zero, which is the balance point where we're taking as much carbon out of the atmosphere as we're putting into it, getting to net zero by 2050. So I think of those in two chapters. The next 10 years, mm-hmm. the most important, I mean, we, that's where the existing technologies, we just need to deploy them. Uh, so in developed countries like the US, that means retiring the old fossil infrastructure, the coal plants. It means using natural gas to push coal out, but not building a whole lot of new natural gas. And it means um, putting in, it means massive build out of renewables, of electrification for electric vehicles, um, uh, you know, and and transit. Um, It means, you know, really focusing on implementation of, you know, the technology we have now that cut emissions dramatically. And you can do that and make a huge difference. Globally, it means building out electric mm-hmm. systems in places where they don't have them, but doing that with those low carbon alternatives with a zero carbon possibilities, renewable mm-hmm. power, battery storage, and so on as much as possible. It also globally means ending tropical deforestation. That's one of the most important yeah. things we can do. And if we don't do it in the next decade, we don't get another chance yeah. when, the, when the forests are gone. So those are the priorities I think for the next decade. Then when you look from 2030 to 2050, how does the, how does the US, the EU, and ideally the world get to net zero? That's going to require not just continued implementation of those technologies, but it's going to it's going to require getting into what you know the industrial sectors, steel, cement, uh, and so on that are much harder to abate. That's going to require new technologies. We have many of them on the drawing board or in prototypes, but it requires accelerating. Technology, technological mm-hmm. innovation. That means um, investment in R and D. It means investment. In, we're going to need new energy technologies to get all the way to a zero carbon power sector. Um, we're going to need technologies that can suck carbon out of the sky, carbon dioxide removal technologies. I think all all of those are uh, on the drawing board. We've got prototypes. It's it's not pie in the sky, but we need investment yeah. in. Uh, in technological innovation. And the good news is that that investment in innovation is going to be an investment in the future. It's an investment in more prosperous economies, in jobs, in growth, and so on, uh, not just in the US and the EU, but around the world. Um, so that's describing kind of the concrete. But if I pull mm-hmm. back for a minute, what is it going to take to get there internationally in terms of international cooperation? That's That actually I, I bring back to where we started, which is American leadership. Um, be, 
because it's not that it's not that nothing can happen without American leadership. We saw the power of the of Europe's example over the past four years, um, but it is a huge boost, right? And and doing all the things I said without a U.S. that is willing to step up and lead, not only globally but also at home and lead by example, doing it without an America that's willing to take that leadership is going to be exponentially harder. Yeah. Um, so American leadership, uh, I think, is going to be a critical ingredient here alongside the continued leadership of the EU. And as I said, the pressure and cooperation and collaboration and a little bit of competition to work with China to push China onto a much greener path, not only into in its own in mm-hmm. its own domestic I- I- I investments, but also in, in the Belt and Road. Um, so I think those, you know, that it, it comes back in a sense of where we started, yeah. which is the pro- uh, realizing the promise and the potential of American leadership. Yeah, I think so too. So 2021 could be a turning point. <laughs> right now we stand at a crossroads for future climate change mitigation. And I think the next months will determine if we will enter a new era of climate cooperation. The crisis as we have tackled or said before, cannot be tackled by single countries, but definitely needs global cooperation in order to ensure a safe and healthy planet for future generations. Um, So as you said, most importantly for the US is to build up trust and credibility, and not only by setting ambitious targets, but also by implementing them and overcoming the legislational um, legislational, um, progress or the obstacles of the Congress, Mm -hmm. so to say, and making climate policy a priority in the US. And when we look at the obstacles or the effects on the national security that are migration and various conflicts in different countries, we can see that cooperating and also helping developing countries and emerging countries um, through climate financing is something that needs to be done the same as pushing China, as you mentioned several times, towards a greener transition, especially in regards to the Belt and Road Initiative. And this is something actually that the EU and the US can do together. And of course, with the help of the US leadership that is most likely to be restored to its fullest, let's say so, let's hope. (laughs) Um, I think there's a good way that this crossroad could start something really good and time will show in which direction we will be heading but it's definitely clear that this global cooperation is essential to effectively tackle this crisis so now we've come to the end and i wanted to thank you very much for recording this podcast with me and for showing your sharing your insights with our audience it has really been a pleasure talking to you Thank you. Well, thanks very much for, for, for inviting me on. I, it was a great conversation. Really appreciated the chance to talk with you. Thank you. I appreciate it as well. Um, so to our audience as well, thank you for listening and stay tuned for our next episode about US-EU relations. Mm-hmm.